Rock Walla Vlogs, episode 129. Mizzle and Mac out here in LA with my man Zeke from Documentary TV and his beautiful Rock Walla Roscoe. This is a collaboration video between Documentary TV and Mike Mongo too. Like, share, and subscribe, and enjoy the video. My name is Zeke Dixon. I am the producer of, uh, you know, if you don't recognize me, it's, you know, hey, this is Zeke Dixon. This is Documentary TV, YouTube channel for dog lovers. Um, this is my boy Roscoe, and we are here in uh, sunny Southern California. Uh, enjoying the, the beautiful weather. I'm gonna tell you right now, this is January 16th or 16th, I believe, and it's gonna probably be like 90 degrees. We don't necessarily need all y'all, but for all the good ones, the nice people, the beautiful people, the dog lovers, if you're tired of that cold weather, come to California. You know, we, we got open areas, we got beautiful weather, you and your dog will love it here. In the 70s or the 80s, there was a movie called The Omen. Uh, I was really probably way too young to be watching The Omen, especially by myself. Um, but if you're, if you're familiar with The Omen, it's basically Damien, the son of the devil. Uh, he has two dogs and they protect him. And, that, and the breed they used, they cast for that movie was the Rottweiler. So early, very early on, early on in my life, I was of the mindset that I would never own a Rottweiler. It was a, it was a, it was a signal of the, a mark of the beast. And I never wanted to have that in my house. Um, and that's pretty much how I lived most of my, uh, my young life. Now, to be quite honest with you, in my neighborhood, uh, there were no Rottweilers. Um, we may have had one or two Doberman Pinschers. We had a ton of, um, like a lot of the older men, the fathers in my community, they had German Shepherds, a lot of German Shepherds. And then the, the, the generation before me, the, the men or the boys, you know, five, six, seven years older than me, they were, they were getting into pit bulls, American Pit Bull Terriers. That was kind of like, you know, as I was, 15, 16, 17, that was my thing. I wanted to get an American Pit Bull Terrier. My parents weren't, weren't going for that. My father knew what the breed was about or what a lot of the boys were doing with the dogs, and he said I couldn't have them. And you know, I was still in high school, so I never I never had them. And after that point, you know, I, I transitioned into college, and you know, in college I can't have a dog. I lived in a dorm, then I lived in a small apartment, no dorms. Uh, and then after college, I moved to New York and uh, began my profession, working, doing a lot of music videos. Again, living in an apartment. I was always a, always interested in owning a dog, but just never felt at that time, you know, at, uh, 21, 22 years old, that a dog was going to help me move the way I wanted to move. Um, but at that point in time, if you asked me what kind of dog I wanted, I, t I would have told you I still wanted an American Pit Bull Terrier. That was kind of what was fixed on my head. Uh, I will also say, in between that time, though, there was a point in time I had a friend, a co-worker, who, owned, who bred Akitas. And I did love Akitas and I did want an Akita, uh, mainly because he wanted to give me one. And I was like, oh, these are great dogs. They're, they're kind of, you know, they're, they're great dogs. And I, and I was like, I'll I, mean, it wasn't, I wasn't big on hair. I'm still not big on hairy dogs, but I was like, yeah, these, these are cool. His dogs were all cool and I wanted one. But for the most part, it was American Pit Bull Terriers. Um, and, and that was it, you know, all the way through college, all the way up to my adult life. Uh, after leaving New York, I moved to LA. And through a friend of a friend, I met a guy. He had a, a Rottweiler, beautiful, like 130 pound male Rottweiler. He imported from Germany. His name was Max. And you know, two years just being around Max and kind of seeing how Max moved and, and how Max loved and how gentle Max could be, but be so ferocious. I was like, that's that's the breed for me. So I had to kind of reprogram my thinking and understanding of the breed. Obviously, a lot of that pro reprogramming came with age, right? As a kid. I believed everything I saw in the movies, right? But as an adult, I understood, and as a filmmaker, I understood like how things in, in, in movies are not real. And from that point forward, uh, with the with the with the introduction to Max and the, the growth and maturity, I, my mind opened up and I cleared my vision, and I was like, I just fixated on the, the Rottweiler. I was like, this is a dog I want. Uh, but at that point in time, I lived in apartments. They, you know, you can't have a hundred pound, hundred. You can't have a fifty pound dog in an apartment. I lived in a very nice apartment, honestly, and they weren't going for it, right? So, um, so from that point on, I just kind of wanted a Rottweiler. You um, have a passion for film that started while you was young, and you ultimately, as you're growing on age, you develop a passion for for dogs. And once you moved to LA, you kind of merged the two. Right? right? Right. Talk to me a little bit about that. Well, so so basically in my life, I, I think I have two two passions, right? I have a professional passion, which is filmmaking. I've been a filmmaker. I went to school for filmmaking. And like 19, whenever whenever She's Gotta Have It came out, Spike Lee introduced us to black filmmaking. Up until that point, I wanted to be an engineer. And I did a lot of uh, a lot of photography. My, my dad was like an amateur photographer. So 
I would take pictures, but just coming up at where I came up and the time I came up, I didn't understand that photography or filmmaking was even a, a viable career. But obviously with the, you know, seeing what Spike Lee did, he opened my eyes. I went to college and I got a, a degree in filmmaking. So filmmaking uh, since, you know, about the age of 18, 19 has been very much a, uh, a, a definite passion for me. Uh, now my other passion has always been animals. And uh, it started, you know, at a very young age. I can remember when I was like four or five years old watching Mutual of Omaha Wild Kingdom. Uh, I have, you know, four lions tattooed on my shoulder. So I always love them, always love um, powerful animals, right? The domestic equivalent to owning a lion, a tiger, a bear, is a big dog, right? That's what we, that's what we can have. And, that's, and, and, and from that point, and even like an American Pit Bull Terrier, at that point, you know, because American Pit Bull Terrier is very much a, a you know, it has a reputation for ferocity and and, uh, and being a powerful, powerful animal. So basically, you know, with this passion, these two passions that I had, um, they kind of came together with Bully Badass TV. Some of you may be familiar with Bully Badass TV. That was uh, my attempt to make a documentary about the American bully. Uh, and I made a, I made several DVDs about the American bully. And, it, and because I needed the place to um, promote the DVDs, I was posting videos, I was posting snippets to, to YouTube just so I could, so I could uh, embed them all over you know, different websites and other people can, people who were selling my DVDs could embed them into their websites. Um, so the whole, the whole thing behind the American Bully was that it was, like I said, it was a combination of my two passions. I'm a filmmaker, that's my professional passion. I love animals, I love dogs. I live in Southern California, and Southern California at that time, and maybe even to this day, uh, is the mecca for the American Bully. Uh, my tagline for my documentary series, for my, I'm sorry, for my Bully Badass TV series was that the American Bully is the first, uh, is the first breed created by the hip hop generation. Uh, for the most part, if you know anything about the American Bully, it's a very much uh, the passion of a multicultural community, blacks, Asians, Latinos, whites. You know, everybody gets in and everyone fits in to make, to make the breed uh, what it was at the time. Um, so I thought it was, you know, as a filmmaker, I'm gonna make a documentary about it. So I started off by just doing my, doing like interviewing people, and because of the, the, the at that time, uh, DVDs were still popular. People would ask me, "Oh, can I get a DVD of the footage?" So that kind of clicked them. Hey, well, let me just make a DVD. And, and the DVDs did well. I sold the DVDs, uh, but obviously, you know, DVDs are not what they used to be, and YouTube became more of a, um, a, a resource for uh, for revenue. And then I decided, uh, after my daughter was born, to uh, focus on uh, broadening the, uh, the genre, uh, take it out of just bully breeds and make it all dogs. So I transitioned from uh, bully badass TV to documentary TV. And that's where I'm at today. Talk to me about the reaction that you get from certain breeds you post on your channel. So basically you understand how documentary TV works, right? When I first started documentary TV, my goal was to um, first investigate and document the breeds that I was interested in owning. Uh, and you know, I understood that I wanted a Rottweiler, but there were other breeds that were very similar to the Rottweiler that I wanted to, to know about. So I started with the Connie Corso. Um, quick fact, because I know everyone's gonna be like, oh, it's not, it's Cane Corso. It's not Cane Corso, it's an Italian breed respected with an Italian pronunciation. I'm sure even my Connie Corso is probably horrible. An Italian person here that probably say that's a horrible rendition of the, of the, uh, the breed's name, but it's Connie Corso, so I started with that. Uh, and then uh, from there, I moved into other breeds, large breeds, working breeds, that was my thing. Uh, Rottweilers, Presses, um, and that's what I did probably for the first year, a bunch of large working dogs. That's, that was kind of what I was, I was, that was my focus. Um, after that though, I did realize that YouTube is basically, for all that it is, the main thing that it is, is a search engine. And so then at that point I realized there are other breeds out there that um, have um, a lot of search queries. And I started doing other breeds based on, you know, based on what, what, what are the more popular uh, breeds, or more, most, more interesting breeds. And that's when I transitioned to things like German Shepherds, uh, Labrador Retrievers, um, an interesting breed is the Boceron, which doesn't get a lot of search queries, but does very well on my channel. So right now, my channel pretty much revolves around two things. My personal interests, and then um, like breeds that I would be interested in owning or discovering. And then as well as, you know, YouTube being a search engine, what are people looking for?
right after getting Roscoe, um, I got a lot. I got a flood of inf a flood of like uh, uh, I guess questions in my Instagram and on YouTube and Facebook about well, why did I choose a Rottweiler? Uh, and so I, at that point, I decided well, I'll do a series and I'll compare like the other breeds that I considered versus the Rottweiler and why I chose what I chose. One thing I want to I want people to understand is that, and, I, and this is really one of the fundamental um, premises of the channel, is that. You know, you get dogs have purpose, right? Every dog has a purpose, and when you get a dog, you want to make sure that the dog that you get matches your purpose. So, a dog that's, that's like my favorite dog may not be or should not be your favorite dog. Uh, we have two different lines, we have two different situations, uh, and you should get a dog that suits your purpose. Um, so, that, and I thought in that series, one of the things I could do was explain that yes, you know, a bull mastiff, a Connie Corso, these are all great dog breeds. I love them, Dogos. I love them. I would love to own one. But you know, owning a dog to me is not a play thing, right? I mean, it's a serious thing, it's a consideration that I want to take in. They're, they're considerations that I take in before I bring, or before I take charge of a living being, right? And understanding that I'm going to have to give the dog the best life I can give it. And a part of that, and part of doing that, since I know giving a dog a great life is a 24 7 job, then you might want to get a dog that basically, that you have purpose for 24 7. A Rottweiler for me, you know, like right now, like we chilling, he's chilling. I can have this conversation and he can he can lay down. And there's a lot going on around us right now. So, you know, things like that are things that I took into consideration. And there are a lot of breeds that I could have chosen. Um, they were basically six and half a dozen, right? Like the Connie Corso, a great breed. I could have I could have got a Connie Corso and been happy with it. Very similar to the Rottweiler. Um, I would say the difference for me between the kind of course on a Rottweiler may have been aesthetics, may have been the fact that since for 20 years I wanted a Rottweiler. Before I really understood dogs totally, I wanted a Rottweiler. Um, and, and that's why I got it. So I thought that series was basically a way of showing people that we can disagree on the breeds that we love. Every breed is great for what they are, but just identify who you are and what you need and what you want and what your life is about, and then pick a, be or pick a breed that best suits what you got going on. Like you, I have been looking for the my perfect vision of a Rottweiler for years. And when I saw Batman, I knew that he was what I was looking for. Was it the same thing for you when you first saw Roscoe? Right, so I'm gonna be very honest with you. As a, as a person, as a human being, I'm very pragmatic, right? I don't necessarily believe in love at first sight or any of that stuff. Um, and I believe that, you know, I don't believe there's any, anything as a perfect dog. So, and just, but I knew I wanted a Rottweiler, right? And how I got, came to get Roscoe was that, you know, doing what I do, I meet a lot of dogs, I meet a lot of breeders, I meet, I go to a lot of programs. And, and how I decided that I wanted to get Roscoe was that I had filmed Roscoe's grandfather, I had filmed Roscoe's father. And those were probably my two favorite, my two favorite Rottweilers. There was, there was, a, there was, a, certain, there was a certain balance of, uh, companionship, velcro-ness. Like, this dog is loving. I mean, like, I, and I, like I said, Roscoe, I mean, you know, you know, Rottweilers in general are loving, but like, to me, he almost loves like American Pitbull Terrier loves. He's a, he's a loving dog. Uh, you should see him like with my daughter, my son, like, you know, he's just, he's just loving, right? And But at the same time, He's a big, beautiful Rottweiler. Yeah, and so it was all about temperament. Yeah, he loved was, the temperament. Right, right. And so if, if for me, I, I, I prioritize temperament, right? Because I got a wife and I have two small kids. My son's six, or my son's seven, my daughter's six. At the time, they were six and five when I got them. So you're talking about small children, right? And you're talking about a dog that by the time, like, you know, you know when I got Roscoe, I think he weighed about maybe 20 some pounds. And my daughter may have weighed like 50 pounds. Well, now he's over 100 pounds and she's probably like 60 pounds, you know? And I knew that was gonna happen. So I needed a dog that I knew that was gonna basically not necessarily run over my kids. And my and he's like very respectful. Like honestly, like my daughter, who when he was a puppy did the most, um, she was more into him than my son. And it, and it paid off for her because like now, if I'm, at the, if, I'm out in the, um, if I'm out working and I want my dog to, I say, look, look, Roscoe's uh, acting up, go put him in his kennel. My daughter, at like you know, 60 pounds, could take this 115 pound dog and walk him in the backyard and put him in his kennel, right? She can, at the same time, walk him in the house, put him in his crate. He's respectful, right? And that's what I need. Like for me, it was really it was about that. I, need, I needed that because 
you know, you, you know, like I said, life is complicated, you know. You don't want to bring in something that's going to only make your life more complicated. Before I go any further, let me not be disrespectful to the old man in the house, and that's Bernie, right? Bernie was my first dog. He was my sister's dog, and she wasn't doing what she needed to do with him. So I consider him my rescue. I rescued him from her uh, at a time when I wanted a dog, right? And so Bernie is going to be, he's 13 years old now. And the, the beautiful thing about Bernie is, in terms of my family, it's like my kids, they, they, don't, they don't know a day on the planet that Bernie wasn't there. So he's very much, um, he's very much like, you know, he's- He's, he's cemented. He, he's cemented. He's, he's very much a, a foundation block of their lives, right? Which is, which is a beautiful thing. My son by far is way more connected to Bernie, right? And that's because when my son was born, um, I had to go through, I went through a rigorous process of making sure that Bernie was, like baby proof and that meant that um you know i did a lot of training and socializing and, and connecting him to my son and when my son was very little by the time my daughter came around i was very confident that bernie understood how to behave and, and, and what to do and what not to do around the baby um so um my son is very connected to bernie you know i, you know, I walk in the house sometimes and, and bernie will be uh and my son will be laying on the dog bed with, with Bernie, just taking a nap. That's, that's how tight he is. Now, I feel like just the dynamics of my house, like I said earlier, you know, my daughter is more connected to Roscoe. And I think that's because my son had already kind of claimed possessions over Bernie, right? Bernie was very responsive to my son. They, they take naps together. They hang out on, the, on his dog bed together. So I think when, my, when, when Roscoe came as a puppy, and he was a cute little puppy, my daughter was, that's gonna be my dog. I'm a big fan of the Lion King, right? When I was, when, I, when my son was born, I got him a, a little stuffed animal, which was Simba. And then I got my daughter, when she was born, a little stuffed animal, Nyla. So I'm a big, and I'm a big, like I said, I got four lions. Are you a Leo? Yeah, I am a Leo. Okay, they, they make sense. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, so I'm, big on, I'm big on lions. It's cool, it's yeah. cool, it's cool. And so I wanted to, initially when I was thinking about it, I was gonna name this boy Mufasa. That was, I said, that's a good name, Mufasa, African name, you know, uh, legendary, yeah. you know, he's a Indeed. pride, you know. Just, but my kids just wasn't going for it, man. They wasn't yeah. going for it. So they were coming up with all these weird quirky names. And I don't know how we landed on Roscoe, but they were like, yeah, Roscoe, Roscoe. And I was just like, damn. Cause I, yeah. cause, cause I didn't get the name Bernie, you know? And yeah. I, I, I was looking forward to naming, you know, and I never said it before, but when I was a kid, kid, I had, for a little year, we I had found a, a, a German Shepherd Husky mix that I own. Yeah. That was my dog, theoretically, it was my family's dog, because my mom named him Huggy, and I didn't, I didn't, so I didn't get the name Huggy. So I was like, I'm naming this dog, and then I wanted to name him Roscoe, but, I, mean, I wanted to name him Mufasa, but, you know, I kind of, I'm a father first, right? So kids' happiness, is always going to take priority in my life. And they wanted Roscoe, so he became Roscoe. I fell in love with Roscoe. I, I love it, you know? So they said Roscoe. I said, well, you know what, Roscoe? You the Roddy King. And that's how I came with, like, I said, I saved my, my pride. I put the right. His the full name is Roscoe the Roddy King. My biggest thing is that, you know, I love, I love dogs, right? I'm a, I, you know, I'm a very much a positive person. I'm a person that tries to put love in the, out in the world. One of the main reasons why I do what I can do, a lot of people say, well, how do you do this? How do you do that? Well, the first thing you got to do is you got to open up your heart, right? And open up your heart, what does that mean? That means that like, you go, like when I go to interview people, a lot of these people and for all other circumstances would never cross paths with me. But if you're an open, honest, caring, respectful person, that'll take you into places where, you know, people like me don't necessarily go, right? Mm -hmm. And that's like the first step. So I see a lot of energy, a lot of negativity, a lot of anger, a lot of disrespect on my channel. That's not what my channel is about. That's not what people's lives should be about. And it's definitely not like that's definitely not what someone who claims to be a dog lover should be like, right? Absolutely. If you have the capacity and the the heart to love an animal, then you got to be able to love your fellow person, your fellow human being. And that's kind of where this chat. That's where my channel starts from. And that's why when I see young cats like yourself doing what you're doing, I open up my my, uh, open up my heart, open up my mind, open up my platform 